think we're at 215, so we can go ahead and get started. Um, so today we're going to try to go ahead and finish up uh, section 4.1, the main results in there, um, where we're getting started talking about what are these languages that are more complicated than languages we've talked about so far, but they're decidable. And we're focusing on languages that have to do with the classes of languages that we talked about in units one and two. Um, so we're gonna continue moving forward with that. We'll recap the, the proof of the first theorem, which is our first kind of decidability result, um, at least with respect to this type of language. And then we're gonna show a reduction where we say that if we know how to solve the acceptance, the DFA acceptance language, then we can use that result to solve the NFA acceptance language, to decide the NFA acceptance language. And so that's gonna show us a type of proof that is a key concept that we're gonna need in unit three moving forward. Um, then we're gonna talk about all the other uh, languages that are associated with units one and two, most of which are decidable. And so we will give several more decidability proofs in the form of Turing machine high level pseudocode. Um, so let's go ahead and just get started with this uh, result that we fleshed out pretty fully last time, which is that the DFA acceptance language, which is the set of all strings where I take a DFA and I bundle it with an input that gets accepted by that DFA. So fix some encoding scheme. We talked about one such encoding scheme there's some way of taking a machine that's a finite statement, deterministic finite automaton, and mapping it down into a bunch of zeros and ones that encode the behavior of that machine. And then if I bundle it with an input, any string that fits that format where the input gets accepted by the machine, that's gonna be a string that we say is in this DFA acceptance language, denoted a DFA. So we're trying to show that this is a decidable language and remember that what it means for a language to be decidable is that there's some Turing machine that decides it. So our proof is that we're going to build a Turing machine that decides the language. And if we argue that in fact, it does decide the language and it is a Turing machine, then that means that the language is decidable. So the picture proof for this is we think of a Turing machine as being a box and inside that box, is gonna be a finite state machine and it's gonna have access to a tape, but we're just gonna express it as an algorithm. So the algorithm here expects something as input. And since it's gonna be a Turing decider, it's gonna output either an accept or a reject instruction. So the input that we want to be accepting is a or rejecting is a potential element of this language that we're supposed to be deciding. So every time we pass something into this box, we're passing in something that we want to interpret as a DFA. So think of this as a file expressing some student JFLAP submission along with an input. And we're gonna test whether that input is accepted by the DFA or not. So the way we actually do that test is we say D is a finite state machine. We have it expressed on our Turing machine's tape somehow. So we're gonna scan back and forth through that tape, referencing the behavior of D along with each character of input, which we're gonna to have to read from left to right because that's how DFAs read their input. And by using markings on the Turing machine's tape, the Turing machine will be able to keep track of what the DFA would do if it were running on W. Eventually, we're gonna stop reading W. And when we stop reading W, we're gonna check whether our interpretation of that DFA, our encoding of that DFA is in a final state or not. And if it's not in a final state, then it means that W wasn't accepted. If it is in a final state, then it means that W was accepted. And so whichever the answer, we're just gonna forward that and that's gonna become the output of our Turing machine. And the output is telling me whether or not D accepted W. Well, whether or not D accepted W is the same thing as whether or not D and W together are an element of this language. So the rationale here is that this acceptance criterion, whether or not D accepts W, that ensures that J accepts only and all of the strings 
that belong in the ADFA language. So that means that J is a decider, except it doesn't quite mean that J is a decider because it's still possible. We have to make sure that it's not possible that J ever gets stuck on any inputs because getting stuck on inputs doesn't necessarily change your language, but it does move you from being um, a decider to something that's just a recognizer. So to argue that J never gets stuck, we're just gonna say, I know that DFAs are finite and they behave deterministically. So there's some finite number of steps that D, that D is gonna take on W. And once that finite number of steps is over, then I can conclusively give a yes or no answer. So I'm never gonna loop on phase one. So most of these decidability proofs are gonna be pretty short like this. And I think that this picture here is really kind of what the, the way you want to be visualizing these types of proofs. So there are any questions about this before we go on to talking about why this means that NFAs are decidable as well, or the NFA acceptance language is decidable? So you mentioned that we use markings to separate different states on the DFA. So, so that means that we are simulating a multi-threaded Turing machine, right? Um, the encoding example that I went into last time was actually not multi-tape. Um, if you want to think of an encoding scheme where you are using multiple tapes, that's fine because you're allowed to do that too. Okay. Well then, um, let's go on to talking about the NFA acceptance language. And I will just write that as a theorem statement because that's what is the next theorem in the book. So theorem 4.2 is that the NFA acceptance language, which is a NFA defined as the set of strings, which are an NFA bundled with a W where the NFA accepts the input W. So that set of strings, that language, theorem 4.2 says is a decidable language. Okay, so The key technique we're going to use for unit three is something called a reduction. Wait, quick question before yeah. we move on. So it's so the ex, it's a language that is decidable. Correct. Okay. Yeah. In the same way that we would say a language is regular or a language is context free, we can also classify a language as being decidable. So when we're talking about the Chomsky hierarchy, what we're putting inside various places of the Chomsky hierarchy are specific sets of strings, and each of those sets of strings we're going to call a language. So a set of strings that fits this, these criteria, that set of strings is given this label ANFA, which corresponds to the NFA acceptance decision problem, and this theorem is arguing that that set of strings is decidable, meaning there's some Turing machine that will accept every string that looks like this and reject every string that doesn't. Okay, so our proof is going to be structured the same as our previous proof. We're going to build a Turing machine. I'm gonna call this J prime. That decides a NFA. Now, the reason that this is called a reduction is because what we're going to do is we're going to take an NFA problem, an NFA acceptance problem, and convert it into a DFA acceptance problem, and then take that DFA acceptance problem and pass it through our algorithm or Turing machine that we already have to decide the answer to that problem. Now we wanna make this conversion process such that I can take 
my answer from J and infer what my answer for J prime should be. So there's a very nice visual for this, but let's write the pseudocode first. So we see that this is just an algorithm and we think of this as being an algorithm that runs an existing algorithm as a subroutine. Let me give a little more vertical space here. So I'm going to write this using the notation of the book where I say, let's let J prime be the Turing machine defined as follows. When I pass in an N and a W, where N is an NFA and W is a string, I don't know for sure whether W is gonna be accepted by the NFA or not. That's what I have to be responsible for. And I also technically don't know for sure that N is not an, an NFA, but I'm implicitly assuming that I'm gonna check whether N can be interpreted as an NFA and I'm gonna throw it out immediately if it can't. So my first step is gonna to be to take this NFA acceptance problem and convert it into a related DFA acceptance problem. So I'm gonna describe this by just kind of calling back to something we did earlier in class. I'm gonna follow the conversion steps from unit one to encode a DFAD where the language of that DFA is equal to the language of my NFA. So for right now, I'm ignoring W. I'm saying, look at that encoding of N. And there's some process that we've talked about, and we've talked about it algorithmically. One of our key results from unit one is that any non-deterministic finite automaton can be turned into a deterministic finite automaton. And it involves a lot more states because each subset of states in the NFA is potentially gonna be a state in an equivalent DFA. And then I take all of those transitions and think about the different threads that can be alive and I map them to transitions in a new NFA. So I'm gonna take this process and do it, and maybe I'll use some of my scratch work on my tape, I'm not gonna get into the details of it, but the way I'm gonna end step one is I'm gonna have this new encoding of my new equivalent deterministic finite automaton in place of N on the tape. And then I'll clean up all of my scratch work. So after step one, I just have an equivalent DFA that's living on the tape. And the answer to whether, since it's equivalent, the answer to whether or not the DFA accepts W should be the same as the answer to the original question of whether N should have accepted W. Then step two is where I call on my process that I've already confirmed is something that I know how to do. I'm gonna follow the steps for J from theorem 4.1 on the input that's now living on my tape, which is that DFA and W. So this is an equivalent problem. The answers to the two problems should be the same because they're equivalent machines. So I'm gonna say, if J accepts, and now I'm talking about if J accepts D and W, then I'm gonna accept, but this is corresponding to an acceptance to the NW into the ANFA language. Otherwise, I'm gonna reject. Okay, so let's think about this diagrammatically. I have a box that represents J. And what I wanna do is visualize a box that represents J prime and how this relates to J. So I'm gonna draw a rectangle that corresponds to all of the steps that J prime is gonna take. And the reason that I do this is because it helps me keep track of what form of input I'm looking for. So J prime 
is supposed to take an input that looks like an NFA combined with an input. So I always have this little step zero, which says if my format is wrong, then skip everything else and go ahead and immediately reject that input. But otherwise, I'll go on to step one, which is to convert an N, my N, into an equivalent DFAD. So then I have D and W that live on my tape at the end of step one. And now I can pass these into a machine that's represented by this J box up here, because D and W are fitting the input requirements of J. So I'll have a box called J, let me make it a little bit bigger. And what J does is it runs D on W. And if it accepts, that means that DW is in the DFA language. And if it rejects, that means that DW is not in the DFA language. So if D and W are in the DFA language, assuming I did step one correctly, I should take that and accept because that means that N and W, my original input, are in the NFA language. Otherwise I'll reject because it's not in the language. So this is often shorthanded, a reduction like this is shorthanded by saying A NFA reduces to a DFA. So if I take an NFA input, I can convert it into a DFA input, and then I can solve the problem there. Now, what this means, or the way I could actually read this as a full sentence that's parsable with all of the definitions that we know, is that the decidability of a NFA and we're adding the verb reduces to the decidability of a DFA. Now I'm gonna pause and say that I, um, as I sent out in an announcement today, I posted this morning a little 10 minute discussion of runtime analysis. We're not going to do rigorous runtime analysis. We're going to do kind of fuzzy runtime analysis, exactly like that micro lecture, just for this current homework, um, for question four of the current homework. Um, so what I'm going to say right now is sort of an aside for people that do have some background with runtime analysis. It's not really something that you need to be following along otherwise. Um, this phase right here in step one is a phase where we have exponential blow up. And what I mean by exponential blow up is if I think about how much space it takes to encode an NFA, and then I convert that NFA into an equivalent DFA, I'm going to go from having Q states to two to the Q states. So I'm creating an exponential increase in how long of an input I'm going to have for J. So I can have a short n problem, and that turns into a long d problem. And so the runtime for the d portion of the machine is going to be a lot longer than if I'd had a DFA to begin with that was the same size as my NFA. So that exponential blow up does not factor in to what we're talking about with reductions. When we talk about reductions, we're just talking about the yes no aspect is this language decidable or not? So we are not concerned about efficiency at all. 
the efficiency of figuring out whether an NFA accepts a string is worse than the efficiency of figuring out whether a DFA accepts a string. But the important thing is that we say if a DFA is decidable, that means that we have this subroutine that we can plug inside this larger problem. And just knowing the pre-processing that I need, ignoring the fact that it's exponential blow up, if I can figure out what pre-processing I need in order to use that subroutine, that tells me that a NFA is also decidable. even if it takes a lot longer. So thinking about this as an if-then statement, you're gonna see an arrow like this. What this arrow actually translates to logically is that if a DFA is decidable, then our reduction shows us that it must follow that a NFA is decidable. So the implication the decidability implication actually goes in the reverse direction of that arrow. So this is a section uh, that you might kind of want to flag mentally because this, this reasoning is by far the, the key stumbling block for just getting lost in, in the direction that we're trying to, to prove things for the main results for this class. So make a mental note of what we talked about here. And after we see a couple more um, reductions, come back to this point in lecture and make sure that you're totally solid on this. Any questions at this point? Okay, so we have these other languages where we also wanna pro uh, provide some decidability results. So, We have um, a language called EDFA, and I'm gonna write this up as another theorem. This is 4.4 in the text. So EDFA is no longer a machine bundled with an input. These are just gonna be sets of strings that encode a single machine, and it should be a DFA. Specifically, it should be a DFA whose language includes nothing. So we wanna show that this language is decidable. So an example of a DFA- uh, Sorry, quick thing. The language includes nothing or is nothing? It is nothing. Okay. It includes no strings. So there, there exist no strings that will be accepted by D. If there exists no strings that will be accepted by D, then D is an EDFA. Not even the empty string? Correct, yep. If EDFA accepts the empty string, then its language is not the empty set. And so that machine should not be an EDFA. Okay. All right, so um, if I have, um, something like this guy that accepts all strings of length at least one, then that shouldn't be in EDFA because it accepts a bunch of strings. But if I have some other weird DFA where I don't make that second state a final state. If I have no final states, then I'm not gonna accept any strings. But even if I have a final state that maybe takes me to other states, if that final state is not reachable from the start state, then that's like one of those states where we say like, let's just not even bother writing it up in the diagram. But the fact that we're not bothering writing it up doesn't mean that it can't be there. So I can have a situation like this. So this is gonna be in EDFA. This guy is not gonna be in EDFA. 
And what we're going to want to do to try to determine which of these should be an EDFA is do a breadth first search from the start state to determine all the states of our DFA that are reachable from the start state. So by reachable, we mean there exist transitions that can get you from the start state with a sequence of transitions to another state. So what this breadth first search is gonna look like is in the case of my thing that is not an EDFA, is I'm gonna start at the start state and say, wherever I am, that's reachable from where I am. And I'm gonna follow all of the arrows from it. So I go from the start, I go to the next, I mark it off, and then I'm done marking everything off. And so what I look at is I say, are there any except states that got marked off? And if so, then it meant that there's some sequence of bits that can take me from the start to the accept state. And that sequence of bits corresponds to a string that's getting accepted. Now on the flip side, if I start over here and I mark off my start state, then I'm gonna follow the one transition that I have and I'm gonna find my second state that I'm gonna mark off and I'll follow the one transition from there and that's already been marked off. So there's nothing left to mark off. And so I'm gonna look at what all is marked and it doesn't include any of the final states. So I'm gonna say that this machine is not an EDFA. So with that insight, I can write this up as a proof. And I'm gonna start the proof the same way that I have the last times. So I'm gonna say, let's build a Turing machine that decides EDFA. Just call it N this time, M. So now the form of my input for this language is I'm looking for just a single encoding of one machine. I'm not thinking about a particular input because I'm interested in seeing whether there are any inputs that get accepted. I can say maybe where D is a DFA. So the first thing I'll do is I'll mark the start state of that DFA. And then I'll describe this breadth first search process as follows. I'm gonna say until no new states have been marked in the previous iteration. Mark every, let's call this, every state that is a neighbor of a currently marked state. So I start with everything that's marked. I look at all of the neighbors, everything that's one transition away from something that's marked and anything that isn't already marked, I'll go ahead and mark it. And then I'll say, hey, in that round, was anything new marked? If so, keep going. At some point, I'm gonna have marked everything that is possible to be marked. And then this loop finishes, and this should be step two, not step three. And when it finishes, the condition that I'm looking for is I'm gonna look of all of my marked state, are any of them accept states? Alternatively, of all of my accept states, are any of them marked? So if, any except state is marked, what do I want to do? If an except state is marked, do I want to accept this machine into the language or do I want to reject it into this language or from this language? Reject. Yeah. So if I find an except state that's marked, that means that there's some input that can get me there. And that input that can get me there is in the language of D. So that means that the language of D is not empty, but I'm looking for Ds where the language of D is empty. So if any except state is marked, I'll reject. Otherwise, I'll accept. 
So this is a Turing machine because this process right here, so this answer takes the problem that I have kind of constructed. I've said the problem of um, determining whether a machine's language is empty is sort of equivalent to the problem of determining whether an accept state is reachable, but it's equivalent in this flip-flopped way. If an accept state is, is reachable, then the language is not empty. So that equivalence allows me to answer the question. And now making sure that this is really a decider comes from the fact that this process eventually terminates. And that's where this until no new states get marked, gets marked comes into play. Because we're saying that each round, we're gonna get closer to having maybe all of the states marked. So I'm, I can't have an infinite number of iterations and each iteration is just taking some finite number of marked states and checking all of their neighbors and that's a finite process. I, I get what you said, thank you. On your first step, what is the second word there? Start. Thank you. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Okay, so our next theorem Wait, I have one question. Yep. On what level do we have to remember these theorems and proofs that? Um, I don't really know how to answer that question. So your final is gonna be open notes. Um, so in a sense, you don't have to remember anything, um, but you wanna think about how much do you need to understand them and able, in order to be able to reason about them. Um, so, so I think that the extent to which you should remember is you, you wanna to get to the point where studying your notes, you look at something like this and you pretty much immediately kind of remember all of the details about why it works. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, so um, EQDFA is gonna have inputs of a slightly different format. So this is saying, let me consider a pair of DFAs. And they're equivalent. Equivalence of DFAs just means that their languages are equal to each other. So the set of all pairs of DFAs whose languages are equivalent is the set of strings that constitute the EQ DFA language. And we're gonna argue that that language is decidable. And the reason that language is decidable is because we're gonna be able to build a Turing machine, I'll call it N, that decides EQ DFA. So here's another case where we can make use of something that we've already illustrated as a subroutine of this algorithm that's gonna decide EQ DFA. So in general, once I've, once I've confirmed that my inputs D1 and D2 are in fact um, DFAs, then they have some languages associated with them. So in general, I can write the language of my first DFA as being some set of strings that I'll encapsulate in a bubble. And the language of my second DFA is gonna be some other set of strings that I'm gonna encapsulate in a bubble. So this is a Venn diagram that kind of like covers all possibilities. I could have strings that are in neither language. I could have strings that are in the first, but not the second, strings that are in the second, but not the first, and strings that are in both. So equivalence of these two machines would mean that they are completely overlapping. So this wedge and this wedge should not exist if the two machines are equivalent. 
So equivalent machines should have an empty symmetric difference. Where the symmetric difference is defined as any element that is in exactly one of the machines and not the other, or exactly one of the sets, but not the other. So what we've done is we've taken equivalent, an equivalence problem and turned it into a related emptiness problem. So in order to use our emptiness algorithm from theorem 4.4, what we're gonna need to do is build a DFA whose language is the symmetric difference. So if I can build a DFA D where the language of D is the language of D1 symmetric diffed with the language of D2, that's that notation that crept up on your first midterm where we defined symmetric difference. Then this guy can get passed in to our Turing machine for E DFA. And if we find that the language of D is empty, then that means that the language of D1 and the language of D2 are the same, i.e. D1, D2 is in EQ DFA. And if this gets rejected because the language of D is not empty, that means that D1, D2 are not equivalent, so they're not in EQ DFA. So our big question is, can we actually have a Turing machine that builds this D? So I can't just say build a, build a, um, a DFA whose language is the, is the symmetric difference if I don't actually know what the symmetric difference is. So let's use some set logic to figure out what the symmetric difference is, or we can refer to midterm one where it was defined for you. We've defined it up here. Um, I can write L D1 symmetric diff with L D2 as being this portion of my general Venn diagram unioned with this portion of my general Venn diagram, where the stuff on the left are things that are in the language of D1, but they're also not in the language of D2. So they're in the complement of the language of D2. So that's this wedge. And I'll union that with things that are in the complement of the D1 language intersected with things that are in the D2 language. And that's the other wedge. So these are everything in the symmetric difference. And now the key here is that I'm trying to build a DFA that corresponds to the intersection of a DFA with the complement of the language of a DFA unioned with the intersection of a DFA with the complement of a DFA's language. So I have a bunch of operations. I have intersection, complement, and union, and then I have intersection and complement again. And I'll remember that we have tools to union intersect 
and intersect languages together. And we also talked about how we can take the complement of a DFA by saying anything that used to be an accept state, make that a non-accept state and anything that wasn't an accept state before, make that an accept state. So these are all unit one tools that we came up with. So we can have a, let's write pseudocode for this, or actually let's kind of, let's write this pictorially. I think the pictures are easier to remember than the pseudocode. Where I say that my input here has to be two machines, D1 and D2, because these are the candidates for my language. I'll pass these in. And then my phase one is gonna to be to turn this into an EDFA problem. So I'll use my unit one techniques to build a DFA D where the language of that is equal to the language of D1, symmetric diffed with the language of D2. And then I'll take that one machine and a single machine is the form of the input that I want for my EDFA algorithm. And I'll pass this into my EDFA Turing machine and an accept will be interpreted as yes, that intersection is um, empty. And so D1, D2 actually are equivalent and a reject is gonna be forwarded as a reject. So step three is kind of just forwarding um, the answer that we already got. So this is everything that you need to know about um, the decidability of languages related to unit one. And I would say that the key here is to always think about the meat of your algorithm and then any prior results that you use. And you want to align the meat of your algorithm if you're doing a reduction so that you end up with a problem where you know how to convert that problem's answer into an answer to your starter problem. And every phase has to be a finite phase. And that's kind of why all of these unit one algorithms um, or all of these unit one languages are decidable because you can always just simulate a DFA. At the end of the day, what's going on with all of these processes is that we are simulating the behavior of a DFA, or we're looking at a DFA and saying like hypothetically on any input, where could we get with this? That's kind of the meat of what's going on um, with your eDFA answer. So ready for unit three languages? So this is kind of like the second half of 2.1. Um, so I'm gonna start with a claim I want us to think about. This is not given as a theorem. Uh, I think it's not explicitly given as a theorem in the book. I'm gonna say APDA, which is the set of PDAs combined with Ws, where PDA P accepts string W is decidable. So my proof sketch is gonna be to define a Turing machine as follows. Take a potential input, 
And the way I did with a DFA is I'm going to run my machine P on W and then report P's answer. So that's gonna be an accept that says that PW is in my acceptance language or reject says that it's not. So this is not exactly wrong, but it's also not necessarily as straightforward as it looks like. Does this raise any alarm bells for you guys? it's gonna be important for you to build the skill of looking at a problem and saying, hey, this guy looks similar to my ADFA acceptance language. In fact, it looks almost identical to it. This is just replacing this definition with PDA instead of DFA. So because it's so similar, let me look at the technique that I used where I just said simulate this and then forward the answer. So that's a good starting point. But then you want to go through the thought process that we thought about before and say, was everything that was true in my previous case still true here? Can't a PDA get stuck in an infinite loop? So we might want to wonder if a PDA can get stuck in an infinite loop because we had to reason in order to finish the proof of theorem four, we needed to reason that the finiteness of DFAs guarantees that step one eventually terminates. So with DFAs, we process the input from left to right. And every time we process one character of input, our DFA takes one step. With PDAs, we also process the input from left to right. So as long as we're continuing to make process in that, to make progress in that input, um, we should eventually finish looking at all of the DFAs. But where the messiness kind of comes into play, I said, I said something, I, I used a weird noun. If we process the input from left to right, we should eventually be able to, to, um, to finish processing all of that input without getting stuck in a loop. But the messiness comes into play in that PDAs are actually non-deterministic. And so we didn't talk about this much, but we sort of mentioned that the non-determinism is actually inherent to PDAs. You can't take a non-deterministic PDA and convert it into a deterministic PDA. So there are gonna be places where I'm deciding whether to read another character of my input or read an epsilon. So that's a choice that I have to make. There also might be places where I have an option of reading another character of W, but there are two different places that my PDA could go when I read that character. So there's sort of optionality in here. And so it turns out that this is something that you can do non-deterministically. But you sort of need to really understand section 3.2. This is not really the approach that we want to take to have a clean and like easy to validate argument. So this isn't really a wrong argument. It's just not an argument that you should have enough confidence in at this point. So what we're going to do instead is what the book does, which is theorem 4.7. We're going to say that the CFG acceptance problem which is just a CFG bundled with a W, where the CFG derives W. We wanna prove that that language is decidable. And now from the argument that we use to show that decidability of the NFA acceptance language follows from decidability of the DFA acceptance language, we can also get decidability of PDAs by saying that 
once we have theorem 4.7, if I give you a PDA in a string, you can use our unit two conversion process to take that PDA as a nasty conversion process and turn it into a grammar and then take that grammar, which is gonna be icky and bundle it with W and plug it into this Turing machine that we're gonna actually describe explicitly that gives us our proof of theorem 4.7. So at this point, we're kind of just gonna sketch these arguments. So this is gonna be a proof sketch, but it's something that if you're solid on your unit two material, you should be able to unravel into more explicit pseudocode. The question is, if I have a grammar and a string, how can I determine that W is something that is in the language of the grammar versus something that is not in the language of the grammar, where this is going to be true if and only if like W is in the language of the grammar, if and only if GW is in our CFG acceptance language. Does anybody recall an algorithm that we learned that could be used to solve this problem? This is not actually the books, the way the book talks about the proof sketch. So this yeah. CYK? Yeah, great. Thanks, Ben. And also thanks, Corey, for the comment. So CYK is the algorithm that says, give me a grammar, give me a string. I'm going to fill out this table using this beautiful dynamic programming solution. And the bottom left cell is going to have some variables in it. If the start variable is one of those, that means that there exists some parse tree that shows that from the start variable, you can derive the string that you were looking for. So one catch is that in order to have a, um, in order to use CYK, your grammar has to be in a particular form. Does anybody remember what form that is? Chomsky? I, I, yeah, we need, to, we need the grammar to be in Chomsky normal form. So we can do sort of a step one, which is convert, convert, convert G to Chomsky normal form. And then step two can be run CYK on our converted grammar and W. And then step three can be to report that CYK answer. So the book says, alternatively, we could kind of use the same acknowledgement or the same recognition that we have with CYK, which is that somehow by, by converting to Chomsky normal form, you can put a cap on the amount of steps that it takes in your derivation to get from the start state to the end state. And so that's why they, the, the way the book describes it is they say, you can start at your start state and then just try all possible derivations of this maximum length and look at all of the possible strings that you could derive and pick the one that looks good. This is a more efficient thing to do. Kind of. So this is another decidable language. A fifth decidable language for today is going to be the emptiness analog where we're just gonna look at a grammar. And the grammars in ECFG are those that derive absolutely no strings. Their language is the empty set. And so we're gonna say that this language is decidable. And so if we want to kind of look back at um, 
how we handled our similar language, we can do that for sort of inspiration. So we have ECFG, and let's just refresh how we solved EDFA. So EDFA was theorem 4.4, where we say, take a DFA and figure out whether or not that DFA accepts any strings. The idea was to start at the start state and search everywhere in our PDA and see if somehow you could end up at an accept state. Because if you end up with an accept state, that means that there was some sequence of inputs you could get, you could read to get there. So we don't have a DFA anymore. Now we have a grammar. So an analog could be from the start variable let's say is any sequence of all terminals possible to derive. So let's kind of just think through this for a little toy grammar. Let's say S goes to A, A goes to AB or BC, and B goes to BA or BB, C will go to CC or Epsilon. So somehow what we're looking for is we're looking for some pathway from the start that takes a bunch of substitutions. And then we end up in a place where we have no variables left. So the only place that has no variables left is this Epsilon. So hopefully we can kind of terminate everything to Epsilon at some point. So we can start from the start state and say, I could turn that into an A. And then from A, I could turn this into either an AB or a BC. And I actually don't care about this little a because that's a terminal, so that's already fine. So I could just turn that into a b, like b is the only live string if I take that first rule. Or I could have b and c that are both live variables. Now from b, I could convert that b into an a having generated another b. And I already have a up here, so maybe I'll kind of move that backwards. Or I could regenerate B. So this is sort of additional recursion. If instead I'd gone to A goes to BC, then B would again have to go back to A or loop on itself. And C could convert to epsilon. And that would actually be something we'd be looking for. Or C could loop back to itself. But the problem is, is that we have this B that will never go away, just like this B will never go away. So this is gonna be a grammar whose language is nothing. It can't generate any strings. This process is a little bit tricky to describe. And so I think it makes more sense in this case, and so does the book, to start from what we're, what we're ultimately trying to find. So we're ultimately trying to generate strings that are all terminals and no grammars. So what we can do is we can go and look on the right-hand side and say anything that doesn't have a variable, that's something that would be a good place to end up with a substring that generates that. So since C can turn into epsilon, then I'm going to mark C as something that can turn into nothing, or it can turn into all terminals. And so anywhere that I have a C, I'm gonna say that's a perfectly valid thing that I could generate. But now if I have C and all of these okay terminals that aren't alive, I see that all I have left are rules that have a live variable that has no way to bottom out. And so from my start state, there's actually no way to get to one of these end states that would generate a string without any variables. So the pseudocode is gonna be, um, how is this written in the text? 
um, let's say, mark all right-hand sides with all terminals. Or let's just say, mark all the terminals on right-hand sides of rules. And then for any variable with an all marked right-hand side, mark every instance of that variable. So if I start by marking epsilon and all of the little a's, b's, and c's, then in my first iteration of this for loop, I'm gonna recognize that C has some right-hand side that's all marked. And then I can go back and mark C everywhere. And if marking C everywhere gives me something else, like if, for example, A had converted into just C and not BC, then I could say, all right, well now A is something that can generate an all terminal. And then I can mark off all of the A's and then I would find that S can generate everything. So if S gets marked, then what this means is that S can turn into an all terminal string. So the language is not empty. So if the language is not, if the language of the grammar is not empty, then that grammar is not in my language of empty grammars. Otherwise, I'll go ahead and accept. OK, so the logical next step that I'm going to pose as a thought experiment for you is going to be to consider EQCFG which are all pairs of grammars whose languages are the same. And I wanna ask the question of whether or not this is decidable. So based on my analysis of unit one, what I'm gonna to try to do is construct a grammar G where the language of the grammar is the language of G1 symmetric difference with the language of G2. And then I'll run my ECFG algorithm on it and report the answer. So why isn't this something that is a valid proof technique here? Don't we have that PDAs are not closed under complements? Yep. So in the end of unit two, we talked about closure properties. At the beginning of unit two, we said that the class of context-free languages is closed under all the regular operations. So this guy is equivalent to LG1 intersected with L G2 complement unioned with LG1 complement intersected with LG2. So this union, that's all good. If I could find a grammar that gave me this and a grammar that gave me this, 
then I would be in the clear and this would be a completely valid construction because I know how to union grammars. However, I do not know how to take the complement of grammars. And in fact, there are some context-free grammars where the language, the complement language is not context-free. So I have no guarantee that this language is gonna be context-free. So I have no guarantee that it's gonna be possible to do that step, step one of constructing a context-free grammar that recognizes it. So this is not gonna be a valid proof And I'm not even going to be able to modify it because it turns out that EQCFG is not even a decidable language. So next time we're going to have one more theorem from the book from uh, 4.1, which is theorem 4.9. And theorem 4.9 is easy to confuse with theorem 4.7. So go ahead and take a look at that. And we'll talk about that at the beginning of next class. And then we'll start talking about 4.2, where we can build our techniques for proving that some languages are actually not decidable. So question on um, theorem 4.8, if you don't yeah. mind. Yeah. The, and the rest of you is to drop off whenever because we're over time. But yeah, I get the I get the general idea, kind of, but so if we have, say the uh, adapted version you have right now, where there is, uh -huh. where S can reach into C. Yeah. How is this proving that L is the, the, la the language of this context-free grammar reaches absolutely nothing? So we're actually trying to show the opposite of, um, so, we're saying that if S gets marked, then what that means is that the language of the grammar is not empty. So we'll reject that grammar. Thank you. That was, yeah, I was just missing that bit. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> Have a good day. You too.